Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Ripley again. We're in section 5.2, cruising right along. We're going to talk about something called the definite integral. All right, so last time we said that, remember, if we take a function from A to B, so if I go from A to B, the area underneath that function, right? If I take a bunch of infinitely thin, think about it this way. If I take an infinite number of infinitely thin rectangles from A to B, then I can figure out the exact area under the curve from A to B. And the way in which we wrote that was the area, this is capital A area, is the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of f of x sub i times delta x. Okay. Now remember, what this really means is add up rectangles. Okay, And this answers the question, how many rect rectangles? An infinite number of them. Now, let's actually do this with a function that we've been playing ball with. And I'm not going to make you do too much of this, but it, it's not so bad, I promise. Okay, watch this. I'm going to take the function. Let's do f of x equals x squared. And we're going to go, we're going to go from 0 to 1, okay? So I want to know the area under the curve, f of x, but I want to know the exact area this time. So instead of using one of our LRAM or my RRAMs or my MRAMs, affectionately known as L sub n, R sub n, and M sub n, all right, I'm going to use this definition as ugly as it looks, as intimidating as it looks, to find the area under the curve from 0 to 1. Okay, so you ready? The first thing's first. First thing's first. I need to find delta x. All right, so delta x, if I'm going from 0 to 1, we know is 1 minus 0 over n, which is the same thing as b minus a over n. Now, what is n? We're not going to worry about it. It's just going to be n. We're going to leave it because, remember, we're going to let n go to infinity. So this becomes 1 over n. Easy, right? Nothing to it. So this one, whoop, check. Now, let's think about something real quick here. I'm going to kind of draw this. I'm going to take f of x equals x squared, but I'm going to do it kind of large. Watch this. All right, so think about it this way. All right, so this is going to be f of x equals x squared, and it's not going to be from 0 to 1. This is like way, this little chunk is going to be tucked way in here. Okay, now think about this. What I need is an f of x sub i. All right, so how do we build that? Well, what we're going to do is we're going to do a right Riemann sum. We're going to think of this as a right Riemann sum. Remember, this definition works whether I take LRAM, RRAM, or MRAM. So we get to pick whichever technique we want to do. In this case, the right Riemann sum is so much easier to deal with. Okay, And I'll show you why here in just a second. Think about it. If my delta x is 1 over n, when I go to build my first rectangle, what I'm thinking of is what is x sub 1? What does this guy equal? Well, if I start at 0 and I go over 1 over n, this is remember, delta x is just the width of the subinterval. That's where I build my first rectangle, and that's my first little rectangular chunk, right? And then what do I do? I, so if I wait, if I start at 0, then I know this value right here. Let me change colors. Then this value right here is actually 1 over n. Okay, that's my first guy. Now, how about x sub 2? Remember, x sub 2 and x sub 1 are just markers where we build our first subinterval. If I go over another x, excuse me, delta x, that's going to be 1 over n again, right? However, where do I stop? I'm going to stop at 2 over n, right? So if x sub 1 is equal to 1 over n, then x sub 2, you see what I'm saying here? That's where I build this second, this second rectangle, right? Then x sub 2 is going to be 2 over n. Now, again, I'm going to go over another 1 over n. Why? Because remember, delta x equals 1 over n. <laughs> That's not a factorial, by the way. Right? So if I go over another 1 over n to build a rectangle, then won't this thing stop at 3 over n? And that's where I build, that's where I build, God bless it, this stylus has been giving me fits. That's where I build my rectangle. All right, so x sub 3 is going to be 3 over n. The problem is, look at the formula. 
The formula says x sub i. So if I go dot dot dot, what is x sub i? Well, can you tell? If x sub 1 is 1 over n, and x sub 2 is 2 over n, and x sub 3 is 3 over n, what's x sub i going to be? It's just going to be i over n. OK? Again, I could, we could do a whole bunch more, but I'm just trying to get you where you need to be. OK, now, we, believe it or not, we have enough information to build the area. I know that the area is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of, you ready, the sum as i goes from 1 to n up. Now, if x sub i is 1 over n, what is f of x sub i? Well, that's easy. If f of x is x squared, then f, excuse me, f of x sub i is just x sub i squared, which is equal to i squared over n squared. See how that works? See what I did? So I know that f of x sub i is i squared over n squared times delta x, which is 1 over n. So remember, this guy right here is f of x sub i, and this guy right here is delta x. All right, now watch this. This is where it gets fun. So I'm going to rewrite this just so we can take our time. This is going to be the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum as i goes from 1 to n of, here we go, i squared over n cubed. <laughs> hmm. Okay, now let's see what you remember from your pre-calc days. Remember, i equals 1 to n So th in this sum. So really, all I'm concerned with is this i squared term because i is like the variable. Now, I know that this feels weird because there's an n cubed in here, but this sum isn't adding up n cubes. It's adding up i's. So really, this n cubed is a constant per this sum. Now, this limit is all about n's, but this sum is all about i's. So if you remember from your pre-calculus days, I know that I can pull constants out of sums. And as far as this sum is concerned, again, because it's only dealing with i's, I can, this n cubed is a constant. So I'm going to pull out 1 over n cubed times the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i squared. Now, let's see what you remember from your pre-calculus. What is the sum as, whoops, to infinity. What the heck's going on here? I said n and wrote infinity. Sorry about that. So the sum as i goes from 1 to n Okay, do you remember what this was? Do you remember what those sums were? The sum as i goes from 1 to n of i. Remember what that was? That was i times i plus 1 over to i. Sorry, God, it's been a while <laughs> since I did these. It's n times n plus 1. This was n times n plus 1 over 2. Remember what the sum as i went from 1 to n of i squared was. That's actually the one that we want for this, isn't it? Well, it was n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. That was that crazy one. And we actually used induction to prove that. And then you remember what the sum as i goes from 1 to n of i cubed was? It was crazy. It was just this guy squared. It was n times n plus 1 over 2 squared. Just that guy. But we don't care about those. We care. Let's change the color here. We care about this guy. He's the one we're going to use right now. All right, so here we go. I'm just going to plug this formula in right here, make my life easy. I get the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n cubed times, now just plug that guy in, n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 all over 6. Well, let's keep this easy on ourselves, right? Watch what happens. If I multiply this out, what do I get? I get the limit as n goes to infinity of, hmm, well, can I do this in my head? If I ignore the n for a sec, I'm going to get 2n squared plus 3n plus 1. So times n is 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n, right? Because n, there's an n, there's a 2n, I, that gives my 3n, and then I multiply through. I did that in my head. You could do that on paper if you had to. And this is divided by 6n cubed. Hey, this looks like a rational type situation, right? I got a polynomial on top, I got a polynomial on the bottom. I'm letting n go to infinity. 
Remember, we could use L'Hopital's to prove this if we absolutely had to, because this is going to give me an infinity over infinity. But we already had in Algebra 2, remember, we learned this with rational functions. If the degree of the top and the degree of the bottom are the same, the limit at infinity is going to be the ratio of the lead coefficients. Because another way to do this algebraically is just divide everything through both top and bottom through by n cubed. And guess what I end up with? Yay! I end up with a third. That's good times. Now, there's only one problem. First things first, mathematicians are not into writing something like this every single time that they want to figure out the area under a curve. And remember, we decided before that the area under the curve looks to be relatively important. So what we need is, remember this, where delta x equals b minus a over n, and this represents the area under f of x. Remember, under is, let's put that in parentheses so we're not confused, under f of x on the closed interval from a to b, right? Yeah, we don't like that as mathematicians. It takes too long to write, and remember, we're lazy. So what we need is something that's way more concise, and this is called the integral from a to b of f of x dx. And the way in which we say this is, just like I just said it, the integral from a to b of f of x dx. That's how we say it, and they mean exactly the same thing. No difference. Now, you need a little bit of, of terminology here, okay? This guy right here, <coughs> excuse me, this guy right here is called the integrand. Integrand. Think about it like radicand in a radical. All right? This guy right here, whoop, and right here, these two guys are called the limits of integration, of integration. But really all that they mean are the boundaries, right, on the closed interval. All right, integration. But I'm going to refer to them as limits of integration. And then this guy right here, if the, I refer to this as a placeholder or a dummy variable. But, okay, what it basically tells us is, remember, in the end, what is dx? It's delta x as n goes to infinity. So really, this guy right here, it's the placeholder for the variable. For the variable. That's what it algebraically represents. However, what it really represents is, and I'm going to scream and yell about this, is the width of the subinterval as it goes infinitely small, subinterval, as it goes infinitely small, okay? So we have this new wonderful notation that we can use instead of having to write this god-awful monstrosity, which looks really good at cocktail parties and at uh, Thanksgiving dinners. However, it's really hard to work with, whereas this, bam, if I want to write, it's the integral from A to B of f of x dx, done. And all mathematicians know what it means. Okay? Hey, let's come up with some quick rules, and then we'll be done for the day. So let's go rules about integrals. All right, and the, oh, by the way, this is called a, you know what, I'm going to erase that and call it a definite integral. All right, about definite integrals, definite integrals, okay? And the definite integral, we'll just put it right here. This is the integral from a to b of f of x dx. It's called a definite integral because it has limits. If it doesn't have limits, it's called an indefinite integral, and we'll get into that in, in a little bit down the road. Okay? So we're talking about rules about definite integrals. All right. So let, first and foremost, let's think about this. I'm going to draw a function, and then we're just, you know what? I'm going to need lots of space. So maybe we'll pop over to the next page so that I have plenty of space to work with. And I don't want to have to keep referring back and forth to the 